What's up guys? Today we're going to be going over traction. Not too much here today with traction, but it's an important one because the boards will test you on safety of indications and contraindications for traction, red flags for somebody who shouldn't be using traction, and then, you know, kind of the force application of traction. So let's get into it. So some indications for traction. So the big ones that are dealing with lumbar traction would be a disc herniation, and that would be treated in prone. And for spinal stenosis, that would be treated in supine. So those are the big ones for lumbar traction, disc herniations in prone, and spinal stenosis in supine. Remember for cervical traction, that is just in supine. So joint hypomobility would be another indication for traction. So the joints aren't moving too much, whether it be some ligamentous tightness, or maybe it is the um, muscle spasms or muscle guarding. That would be a reason why we, we, we would want to be treating this patient with lumbar traction just to help separate it and get it moving a little bit more. So again, muscle spasms and guarding, that's a big one. Nerve root impingement. This one's typically treated in um, supine. However, it can be treated in both. Essentially, just whatever is going to make the patient feel a little bit better and reduce those radicular symptoms. Ligament or connective tissue contracture. So kind of the same thing along with that muscle spasm and guarding. It could be the ligaments as well with that hypomobility. So anything where everything's super tight, we want to make sure that we're stretching everything out. So traction can do that any sort of subacute pain. So we don't want to do this with any acute condition. Subacutes and chronic conditions are more okay to be treating this. So if you're having some back pain or maybe some neck pain, maybe let's traction a little bit, see how it feels. If it's been pain that's been ongoing for a while, I'm sure you've had somebody that you've treated that had a soft tissue massage to their upper traps. And then you kind of traction them a little bit because they were having some pain just to kind of calm everything down. And then with osteophyte formation, just to alleviate some of that pressure on the joint. So then it's not causing so much arthritis. Contraindications for traction. So as you see, there are a lot more contraindications than there are indications for traction. Um, I'd say know this slide page next bit that I'm going to be talking about if you're listening to this on the podcast very, very well. So contraindications for traction rheumatoid arthritis due to the ligamentous laxity. And also on the other side, we can see the positive alar ligament test that can be caused by rheumatoid arthritis. And that's for very, like mostly very advanced RA, but the boards is, isn't going to say acute or chronic RA. Just RA is just a no-go when it comes to traction. Any sort of fracture, dislocation, subluxation, if something's broken, we shouldn't be pulling on it or putting more stress. If it's already pulled out of place, we shouldn't be putting it more out of place by pulling it. So not a good idea. Any sort of acute inflammation strains or sprains. So that's kind of saying like anything in that acute stage, no. Bad, it's flared up, pain, inflammation, just no. Aortic aneurysm, we don't want to, especially with lumbar traction, we don't want to squeeze somebody who has an aortic aneurysm. That could kill them. Um, any sort of bone diseases or infections that can also include like osteoporosis and stuff like that. All that kind of falls under that umbrella. Again, if we're pulling on the bones, making like putting more pressure on the bones to just like pulling on it and stuff, we do not want that to be happening to somebody who has brittle bones like osteoporosis and obviously any sort of diseases or infections of the bone as well. Pretty much no. So any, generally, if someone's infected or like anything like that, just no. Again, under infections, meningitis, because we're pulling on the spine. Remember, there are those tests for meningitis, and they also are positive signs if we're putting stress on the spine. So if we're putting stress on the spine, we're just exacerbating meningitis. And we should probably have that person go to the doctor if they do have that. Um, any sort of cardiovascular diseases. So again, with cardiovascular diseases, we do not want to be increasing intra-abdominal pressure with these patients. So that is why anybody who has any sort of cardiovascular problem going on, high blood pressure, any sort of um, like history of heart attack, any sort of peripheral like vascular problems, anything like that. No, we do not want to be squeezing that person with a traction belt, bad idea. Hiatal hernia, same kind of thing. If they have that opening through the hiatal hernia, if you forgot, is where they have an increased opening through the diaphragm, where the esophagus, where the esophagus goes through the diaphragm. Again, int increasing intra-abdominal pressure, valsalving essentially as you squeeze them with the traction belt, bad, not good. And then if there's if the patient's symptoms get worse as you traction them, don't do that. 
kind of the same thing with any sort of intervention we're doing with a patient besides if we're cranking on someone's knee. If it's making them feel worse, we probably shouldn't be doing it. Or if it's making their ridiculous symptoms get worse and we don't want to be doing that. If we start pulling on someone's neck and they're like, hey, my finger's numb now. Eh, let's not do that. Pregnancy, lumbar, pretty self-explanatory. Let's not squish the baby. That idea. Any sort of tumors, again, cancer kind of stuff. Pretty much everything is contraindicated for cancer. Also, if you're squeezing a tumor, it could metastasize bad, not good. Joint hypermobility. So if it's already loose and it's going everywhere, we don't want to stretch it even looser. That's not, we don't want to do that. For a hypermobile person, we're working on strengthening, not stretching. Positive alar ligament test. So this is for cervical spine, for cervical traction. Again, that's kind of associated with RA. So if the alar ligament is loose, that means if we try to pull on them, could have some internal decapitation. We do not want that. Remember, the alar ligament is that plus sign one right at the front of the neck there. The positive vertebral artery test. So this is for cervical spine. If you are initiating any sort of cervical traction with anybody, you need to make sure we're bringing the head back into extension and at least 30 degrees of rotation. If the patient starts to lose consciousness and start feeling really lightheaded, bad, bad. Now, remember there's a difference between that. And if they're having vertigo, that's what the nystagmus you, the difference will be obvious. So very rare, but test for that if you're going to initiate cervical traction. And if it's positive, we are not doing that. Um, any sort of TMJ pain or dysfunction. Again, if we're going to be pulling near the TMJ joint on the mastoid processes for cervical traction, we do not want to be exacerbating their TMJ. So this was a long one over here with the contraindications, but these are all super important. The force for traction. So this is the other thing the boards is going to ask you about when it comes to traction. So with cervical traction, we're going to start with 10 pounds of force for the first time, always, regardless. I don't care if it's somebody who's got a big fat meat head, 10 pounds, that's it. Because we don't want to be pulling more than that because we want to see how the person tolerates it because 10 pounds could be a lot for this person. It could be pretty tight. So we're keeping it on the safe side, 10 pounds for the first time for cervical traction. After that, if we want to alleviate muscle spasms or any sort of muscle guarding, we're going to pull between 10 and 15 pounds of pressure. And then this is around seven to 10% of the patient's body weight ish kind of numbers. I would just go with the 10 to 15 pounds. That's what the boards is going to ask you, but this is just to help pull a little bit to alleviate those muscle spasms. Just stretch it out a little bit. We're not trying to separate the joints here. Remember, for muscle spasms, we're pulling with less force than if we were going to do joint distraction. So if we're trying to do joint distraction with this cervical patient, we'll pull between 20 and 30 pounds of pressure for joint separation, distraction, whatever you want to call it. And remember, we got to pull a little bit harder to distract the joint. Do not, do not exceed 30 pounds of force for cervical traction. I will say that again. Do not exceed 30 pounds of force for cervical traction. I already think 20 is a lot. I remember when I had this done on me in class and I was like, I feel like my head's going to fall off. 30 is a lot. We're not pulling. No, bad. That could start to uh, go from uh, joint distraction separation to head distraction separation. We don't want to do that. So on the other hand, when it comes to lumbar traction, um, there is, I highlighted this in my notes and so this must be important in some sort of way, but the coefficient of friction for when it's a person's body between the mat table and the person's body is 0.5. So just kind of remember that. The, if we're trying to stretch the muscles and treat muscle spasms and guarding, we're gonna use 25% of the patient's body weight, just 25%. So I'll say that again, 25% body weight for stretching and treating muscle spasms for lumbar traction. Now, on the other hand, if we want to have joint separation and distraction and actually get some space between the vertebrae to kind of help with that of uh, the, the vertebral discs and have them kind of elongate and you know fill back up, we wanna have 50% body weight for joint distraction or separation. So let's say you have your patient and they weigh hundred pounds if we want to just stretch the muscle, we're pulling with 25 pounds of pressure. If we want to separate the joints, we're pulling with 50 pounds of pressure. The boards will probably give you nice numbers. So, you know, 
keep that in mind. So just to recap, 25% body weight for stretching, 50% body weight for joint distraction or separation. All right, guys, here's a sample question for you guys. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient for spinal stenosis in an outpatient physical therapy setting. The patient informs the physical therapist that they weigh 200 pounds. What would be the appropriate setup for this patient in order to achieve joint separation? One, prone, 100 pounds of force. Two, supine, 100 pounds of force. Three, supine, 50 pounds of force. Or four, prone, 50 pounds of force. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is supine 100 pounds of force. So let's break this down. The patient has spinal stenosis and they weigh 200 pounds and we want joint separation. That is the big three things from this question. There's a bunch of mumbo jumbo, just words. That's just to confuse you. Patient has spinal stenosis. That means we want to treat them in supine. So I like to remember spinal stenosis, SS, supine, kind of just the triple S's, kind of keeps it all easy. And then for the other one, if we were going to treat them prone, the, the main pathology that we would treat in the prone position would be a herniated disc. So I think either disc down as in head down, or it might show up as a herniated nucleus pulposus. And so I think of the P prone down. So remember herniated disc, we are in prone, spinal stenosis, we are in supine. So the patient says that they weigh 200 pounds. Wow, nice easy number. What are we gonna pull with? Well, let's see what we're trying to achieve. Joint separation. So with joint separation, that is 50% of the patient's body weight. So half of 200 is 100. So that is where we get our 100 pounds of force. Now, if we wanted to achieve um, like stretching and muscle spasms and stuff, and alleviating that, we would be with 50 pounds of pressure because then that would be 25. So numbers in here, just kind of remembering what's important, what we need to think about. Remember the pathologies that like prone, the pathologies that like supine, and then 50% body weight for joint separation, 25% body weight for muscle spasms. And this is for lumbar traction. So... I hope that this was helpful in explaining stuff. Um, I hope this was helpful, everybody. So take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.